I'm in the process of taking this uh, Power Stroke 7.3 liter from a, a 97 F250 two wheel drive, uh, getting ready to swap it into uh, a 58 Chevrolet two and a half ton truck. I wanted to talk a uh, little bit about the steps I'm taking or, or, or what needs to be done to move this thing over. Uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, out there that this platform is terribly difficult to move. Um, that you need to keep all the original wiring harness out of the cab, that you have to move the gauges over else the engine won't run. Uh, a lot of guys just tell me, why don't you just take an old IDI uh, and move it over because there's only two or three wires that, that you need to hook up to make that thing run. Um, when you get into this, this is as equally simple to move over as an IDI engine. Uh, there is again two or three wires that you're going to need to hook up uh, to make it run. Uh, it seems more complicated um, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of wires associated with this, this particular truck. Um, but once you get into uh, tearing it apart, it, it's actually quite simple. Um, let's talk very briefly about uh, what I've got going on here. So the engine's still sitting in its original chassis, just uh, easy to keep it in there to um, get this thing, you know, for the testing purposes, get it running, whatnot. i got the fenders still on there. It's the only thing left of the truck. they got some metal strap holding them in place uh, and some... Uh, tension strap in there to sort of hold them up. Uh, the batteries are on there, the radiators on there, it's just easier to keep it keep it like that uh, than trying to move the engine into a run stand um, which I do have but it was just much easier to do it here. So from the cab you're going to keep just a couple of things. You're going to keep the accelerator pedal harness, the barometer uh, which is hanging down low right there uh, and you're going to keep uh, of course if, if you want it and I don't see why you wouldn't your data link connector which I have sitting up underneath here um, I've got auto ingenuity and I've hooked it up into the data link connector and it communicates just fine to the engine uh, as I have it right now. Um, uh, the gauges, I have some of them uh, wired back up. In fact, I have everything wired except for the uh, fuel level gauge and the, and the speedometer. Uh, this thing's not going anywhere anymore, so speedometer is really not necessary. Uh, and all that works just fine. Um, again, I got rid of the cab harness altogether, so I am connecting everything up directly um, to the connection points that it needs to go, whether it's uh, from the PCM or if it's from a, a sensor out there that's providing the data. The PCM right now, sitting down here on the fender, uh, in an old for sale sign that I chopped up, and it's just, just hanging out in there. Uh, that's all it needs to do. The IDM is still bolted to the fender where it normally goes. Uh, I have a control panel sitting up here uh, for my run, stop, push to start. I brought up just two lights. That's, that's really all I'm interested in right now for my testing, the wait to start light and the check engine light. Um, the PCM controls both of those. Those lights sit there with a, a supplied 12 volts uh, as soon as the key switch is turned on. Um, and the PCM is supplying the grounds to them when, when it determines they should be lit or, or not. Uh, the fuse box, uh, so from the cab there's uh, one additional thing that you move and that's the fuse for the idle validation switch. That's the only fuse in the cab uh, that you're going to care about for getting this, uh, making sure this engine runs properly. Uh, let's go underneath the fuse box here uh, quickly. I have gutted this thing down to get rid of all the other fuses that I don't want, don't need anything associated with, with headlights or any other kind of lights on the vehicle, horns, anything like that. Um, that I don't care about uh, is now gone. Uh, I did a little bit of rewiring underneath there to make it more convenient to bring over that idle uh, validation switch fuse. That's this 3 amp fuse right here. If you're familiar with these fuse boxes, uh, it's a backplane style, uh, uh, meaning that the 12 volts coming in here from the battery is just across a backplane. So all the fuses all the time have 12 volts to them, whether the key is in the on position or not. There's a couple of exceptions in there. Fuse number 22 is one of them. He is uh, switched from the key uh, normally, and he still is now. I didn't change anything about that. Um, the relays in here, the IDM, the PCM, still in their original positions, nothing changes there. I added these two here on the end. This one is for my fuel pump. I have an e-fuel setup on here, and this one controls these three positions right here that I rewired. These are now switched off the key. Uh, when I turn the ignition on, this guy's energized. He threw a fuse here, um, energizes these three slots right here. This fuse down here um, I put in uh, for the fuel pump. So uh, he runs through the relay uh, on over to the fuel pump. 
Uh, this guy is now wired back to the uh, idle, va idle validation switch, and these other two positions are for future use. I have pigtails hanging down underneath there uh, if I choose to use them for something uh, that they're available for me for switched uh, 12 volts. Okay, so why is it so simple? <laughs> That's my claim anyway. Um, when you pull it apart, um, you're going to have just a couple of wires that you need to hook up. There's going to be uh, a wire for a constant 12 volt, which is the PCM Keep Alive. Again, he's hanging out down there on the fender. So he's got 12 volts all the time off a dedicated wire. That's what its purpose is to do. Um, you're going to have another one in here uh, for uh, fuse number 22, which I believe is this big red, red and green wire here. Uh, we can come on over here and see. I've got uh, the constant uh, 12 volts coming in right here off this yellow wire. And this yellow wire is an original wire out of the wiring harness. I didn't do anything different here. So um, that's my 12 volts coming in. And then I am switched uh, over to this side over here. This is my uh, fuse number 22, uh, plus a couple other things that I wanted to have switched off to 12 volts, uh, like those relays over there and things like that. So when I turn the key on, it wakes up fuse number 22. He turns on the PCM, the PCM turns on the IDM, uh, and things are, are ready to start to rock and roll. Um, let's see. Uh, from the underhood harness, let's go there next. So you, you, you need virtually nothing from the underhood harness. It gets tossed away as well, all the headlights and horn and everything like that. Uh, no need for any of that stuff. Uh, I opened it all up, pulled out just the wires that I need. The big yellow wire in here, this is the big battery wire uh, coming straight from the battery over to the fuse box. Uh, three of the wires in here, which are a green, gray, and, and a brown up here, these are the map sensor. Um, so we're going to hold on to those. Uh, we have a black and white, that's a ground wire in there. Um, common sense, you keep your grounds connected. Uh, the red wire here, this is the starter relay, so this is just a momentary 12 volts over to the starter. And then finally, uh, this one right here is the dummy light for the alternator in the cab. Believe it or not, you need that. And here's the reason why. Let's step back over. I don't know if you saw it uh, previously. Aside from the lights that I have up here, the check engine light and the, and the wait to start light, I've got another light sitting down underneath here. This is my dummy light um, for the alternator. Turns out uh, you're a dummy if you don't hook it up, and here's the reason why. When you turn that key to the on position, uh, this alternator um, needs to receive 12 volts through the green wire um, through that light bulb. Uh, and what happens is that energizes an electromagnet on the outside of the, the alternator, the stator. Uh, these alternators don't have fixed magnets in them, so if you just start spinning the alternator, it does not produce electricity. You have to first supply 12 volts. Uh, that energizes uh, the outer, again, the outer magnet. Uh, the electromagnet becomes a magnet. You turn the uh, alternator, and then the inner coil begins producing electricity. When the voltage comes up high enough, there's a switching mechanism uh, that happens inside the alternator, and that puts the, alt, the, the outer electromagnet on an internal power source. It disconnects the supplied power source. Um, that removes the ground. Um, that's being supplied uh, internally and the light on the dashboard goes out. Um, so you do need to have that hooked up otherwise your alternator will not start um, when you're running the engine. You'll, you'll test and see 12 and then you'll see it diminish to 11. You'll wonder why, why is my voltage dropping? It's because the alternator's not running. Uh, let's come around the other side here. The alternator harness is independent of the underhood harness, so there's not uh, a lot of effort that you have to go through there. It's just connected to the starter relay. Um, you, I pulled out the wiring just to see what else was buried in there. Um, so I've just got the, the big heavy wire um, and the green wire and the yellow wire that are all part of that harness. The only other wire running out to the engine is for the glow plug relay. Uh, it too comes off the starter relay at the battery connection. Uh, the map sensor I have just hanging out over here on the fender. Uh, I put a boost gauge on there uh, for all my testing here. I can see, you know, if I'm building proper boost and things like that. Uh, my e-fuel setup that I have on there, uh, it's hard to see down in there. It's a uh, uh, specialized uh, kit that I make myself. I have that in another video uh, on YouTube, can be found. 
See if we can get over the top of it here for a moment. Um, it's a fuel block that I, I build. Um, I have a gauge sitting on it right now, so for testing purposes, I can watch what's going on down in there. Um, but it's it's it works very well um, so far in all of my testing and, and some of the kits I've sold to some guys. Uh, very pleased with it. Uh, let's go talk briefly now about some of the tools that you're going to need um, to do this successfully. Take a walk around the shop over here, and I have them laid out on the table. Um, things you're going to need, soldering iron, solder. Um, shrink shrink tubing for sure. Um, a lot of the stuff you see over there right now has blue tape on it. That'll all go away and get replaced with the shrink tubing. Um, because this will be all external, out, outside if you will, um, I will use a, a liquid-tight type uh, shrink tubing versus this. This is just for in, inside use. Um, cutters, knife, you're going to be cutting apart that wiring harness. A uh, fair amount of effort with that. Uh, a multimeter, you're not going to be successful at all unless you have a good multimeter. You're going to test for voltages, grounds, continuities, all that sort of stuff. And then finally, without exception, um, you're going to need the, the electrical and vacuum troubleshooting manual, uh, preferably specific for the truck that you're working on. Um, this one is for, again, the 97 F250. Uh, I picked this book up for about $45. It's a reprint. Um, they're pretty readily available. Sometimes they can be tough to find and and always the F-Series books are going to be in higher demand. Uh, I did a 91 not too long ago, F-Series truck, and I couldn't find the book for it for the life of me, and certainly not for a reasonable price. So all I needed to do was troubleshoot the computer for that particular truck. Uh, I didn't care about any of the other electrical within it, uh, so I found this 91 Econoline book for $12, and it had more than enough uh, similar information in there for, uh, for the engine. Uh, for the 460 that I was working on uh, and let me do it. This was uh, $12 I believe to, for that book. Uh, what else I'm going to be using is uh, my core engine over here um, to do the swap so when I go to set this up into the truck frame um, I've got this one right here to use versus using the, the real engine over there and the reason is uh, this one is my gutless 7.3 motor and when I say that, I know the Cummins guys all start snickering. Uh, is in every 7.3 a gutless engine? Uh, this one I chopped up internally, so it is like literally gutless. There's no nothing in the head, um, kind of like myself. And then there's no sleeves. There's uh, just nothing in this engine. The crankshaft I chopped. Uh, I have only the very front journal in there, which is enough to hold the pulley on the front, and I kind of need that on there for measuring up against the front cross member to make sure I got the engine set at proper heights uh, and things like that. The turbo is gutted as well. There's no guts inside of it. Um, quite an exercise though to chop this thing up. But anyway, uh, it, it lightened the engine up tremendously. If you've moved the 7.3s when they're fully dressed and have oil and everything in them, uh, they're, they're quite heavy. Uh, I did the same over here with a uh, ZF5. Uh, which I'll be uh, using as part of this. Uh, it is also gutted out. Um, I can actually uh, lift this thing up one-handed. So the uh, weight will be so much easier to work with. It's a lot easier to work with about 200 pounds when you're trying to set something you know, gently into place and nudge it over an eighth or a quarter of an inch in one direction and, and up a little bit in another. Uh, 200 or so pounds is a lot easier to work with than, than 1,200 pounds. Uh, this over here, this, this beauty, uh, she came from the junkyard. Uh, exact same year, exact same size truck, uh, the two and a half ton. Uh, doesn't look like much when it's chopped up like that, and you'd be surprised. These trucks look so big on the outside, these old trucks, uh, but when you open that hood up, there's surprisingly very little room to work under there. You know, back in the late 50s, uh, the inline six was typically the, the, the bigger, more common motor. Uh, and then maybe this uh, might have had a 283, a, a small block Chevy or something in it. Uh, I chopped up the back of the cab here as well. Uh, I just didn't want to bring home all that old rusty metal uh, more so than I needed to. All I really need to do my swap, or at least to set myself up in here, is just the firewall uh, and all of the underhood inter inner fender well area. Um, I'll use this uh, to make up the cross members, both front and rear, uh, engine and transmission. 
Uh, the idea was that, you know, as I get chopping away in here, uh, if I make any kind of mistakes, if I cut something away from the truck that I didn't want to, that as I proceed and find out, hey, I really needed to keep that in place, uh, at least I'll have made all my mistakes on a piece of scrap I took from the junkyard versus on my good truck that I'm trying to swap this engine transmission combination into. Uh, let's come back over here now to the truck, the donor vehicle, um, and we'll just do a quick uh, fire up of it over here. So again, uh, my control panel over here, uh, real simple, I'm just supplying 12 volts uh, switch to the PCM. Uh, momentary switch over here to the starter relay. Uh, I've got some of my lights wired up over here so that I can see what's going on. So we give her a flip. We'll get the weight to start. You can hear the fuel pump running behind me and we're ready to go. And she's ready to go. So um, I'm uh, going to get this motor out of here in about another day or two, probably this weekend, and uh, set it aside so I can get this uh, chassis out of my way. I've been tripping over this thing for a couple of months now, uh, and it'd be just nice to finish this project up. So let's now, uh, I'm going to take a moment and go show you the truck, the, the, the donor recipient uh, that this uh, combination will be going into. All right, here's our donor recipient. This is a 58 Chevrolet, two and a half ton, 60 series truck. I've had this truck now uh, probably about 11 years I've been working on it. I did a full frame off, rest, uh, well, refurbishing, I won't call it restoration. Uh, we didn't go back to absolute original condition on this thing. So technically it's just a refurb, not, a, uh, not an actual restoration. Uh, I put uh, all six new radial uh, tubeless tires underneath there. Made a huge difference over the old tube type. Uh, bias plies. Uh, dump box was on there. I stuck with it. Uh, it's actually quite handy having a having a dump box on there. Uh, that's some white oak that I put up on the sides there. I actually got that from uh, the Amish up in uh, Pennsylvania. The only ones that could cut cut the boards a little over two inches thick for me uh, uh, and give me the, the white oak like that. Uh, I'll keep that original. Well, that's not the original fuel tank. That's from 1974. That's the date stamp on that tank, but I'll use that for the for the diesel conversion. Uh, right now it has a 73 motor in there uh, that the previous owner, who was the second owner to it, uh, told me he put in back in the 80s. Uh, he actually bought the truck from his cousin who had bought it new in 58, so the truck was uh, a one family owned truck. Uh, and they both took really good care of it. When I got it, it was teal green. It was a work truck. It had its bangs, its bruises, a few rust spots and things like that. But I cleaned it all up. Uh, the steel wheels on there, I made the center caps. I couldn't find any center caps for this uh, wheel size. So I actually had to uh, do my metal fab skills, get in there and uh, make up center caps for this. The, the bolt caps that are on there uh, are standard. Uh, you buy those at any uh, heavy truck store. Uh, the tailgate I made, it's a custom made tailgate on this thing. Uh, the tailgate that was on it was a half height and only half height of the, the bed there. up. Uh, really not quite up to the midpoint of the boards so I made a, uh, a custom tailgate for it. I made a crank, uh, that's that red cable you sitting up, see sitting up there. I can crank the tailgate up and down, uh, putting a crank handle on that that shaft that's sticking out of there uh, right here. It's a pretty heavy tailgate. Some guys uh, laugh at me, think why do you need something like that? Well when this thing uh, is, is up you know a foot and a half over your head uh, and the weight of that tailgate trying to put it up and down, uh, it's it's pretty substantial. Let's go ahead, jump in, uh, take it for a ride. I will uh, hand the phone uh, camera here to my helper. Get on the other side. Uh, the inside is, is cleaned up as the outside is. It has the old uh, in the floor uh, pedals. Uh, I'll be doing some modifications to that when I, when I put in the, uh, the new motor transmission combo. Uh, again, it has a 73 motor, but the transmission is the original 58. Uh, it's a high-low rear axle in this thing. Uh, it has the granny low. Uh, seldom use that except to get a really heavy load into motion. Uh, and then it's a 
Shifts is a four speed, second, third, fourth, fifth after that. Uh, no overdrive on this thing. Uh, it's an old new process from 58, so uh, let's go ahead and take her out for a quick spin. Radial tires made just a world of difference. When I first got the truck, on those old bias plies, you had, a, you had to drive 30 miles just to get the tires warm enough to get them to be round again. They would oval out, sitting still too long. And the whole truck would just bounce up and down like it was riding on oval tires. And it was real difficult to steer the front when you were like in a parking lot or at a very low speed. It was real difficult to turn the wheels but these radials, man, they, they just made all the difference. The truck is actually fun to drive. But it's a cruiser. It's not a speed demon or anything like that. It's just fun to get out and tool around in, run to Home Depot, run to the mulch yard, something like that. Horse age does pretty darn good. Of course, I pretty much re rebuilt or replaced everything underneath it. So far, the engine drivetrain is the only things left untouched by me. I just went with what he had in there because it uh, worked just fine. So, there we are.